Tom, there is no need for us to make any more of these. We righted the wrongs of the story by putting the one true king on the throne. Look, we made an overly long video about it over here. Don't make me undo such a perfect ending to the story, please. But Manis, oh, all right. Here's how the Tyrells could have won the Game of Thrones. Quick point before we start, as we've never clarified this, and it's our fault when people get confused, books or show? Answer, we try to acknowledge the books where we can and where it doesn't mess with the show's plot significantly. But as of now, the show is the only medium with a finished story, however crappy. It's all we've got post John biting it. So yeah, we mainly run with the show, with some books sprinkled in to be extra confusing. Now Tom has threatened to cut my intros if they ramble too long, so let's get to the point of the video. What are the Tyrell's goals? Power by proxy. The Tyrells can't sit the throne themselves, but that doesn't prevent them from joining the royal fold. Their final objective is to be tied strongly to the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms when all is said and done, and have something resembling influence with them. As always with this series, what are the advantages and disadvantages for the Chosen House? Starting with where they are strongest, the Tyrells, unlike the other houses we've addressed so far, are in a rather unique spot. They themselves are the advantage to any of the other factions. They are rich in both of wealth and grain, a commodity more valuable than gold in wartime, their army is the largest in Westeros, between 80 to 100,000 men strong, and their keep, which is beyond impregnable in the books, is still one of the more defensible of the great houses even in the show, assuming cheat codes aren't active like they were season 6 onwards. There's also some strong players in their lineup, starting with the Queen of Thorns, Olenna, one of the only players who can truly match Tywin's cunning and ability to scheme and plot. When we address decisions, it'll be what we think she would do, since we all know who truly wears the trousers with the Tyrells. Spoiler alert, it isn't Mace. Not now, Mace. Lord Tywin and I are speaking. There's also strength in the heirs. Marjorie and Loris are both young and attractive and therefore good alliance securers through marriage. But they also have so much more to give. Loris is one of the best warriors alive at the time of the game, making him good on the battlefield and even more desirable to most lords who want strong, heroic male grandchildren for heirs. I'm looking forward to your wedding. Our fathers are both rather keen on the prospect. <laughs> they certainly are. Perhaps they should get married. <laughs> And Marjorie is as cunning as she is beautiful. Not her grandmother's level, but definitely a capable player of the game. Also, since we try to acknowledge the books where we can, and since it won't interfere with the show's plot too much, there's also Willis, the actual heir of Highgarden, and Garland. Garland is a great warrior, but kind of useless as an alliance securer as he's already married. And Willis is crippled and, while good-hearted, considered boring, so not great for matchmaking. But he is regarded as intelligent by his grandmother, which is high praise indeed. So his value as an advisor shouldn't be underestimated. The Tyrells also have impressive vassals such as the Tarleys, with Randall being a highly decorated and renowned wartime commander. Where the Tyrells are weak is mainly this guy right here. In the books, Mace is merely unremarkable and a little oafish, but reasonably competent. In the show, he's pompous, privileged, and lacks any true leadership qualities in battle or as at the seat of politics. Not a good look when he's the head of your house. And that about covers the main players in the Tyrell faction. So we've got to switch up the formula for this vid. Normally we do a listicle of the most vital steps each house should take in order to secure their victory. However, the Tyrells are in a rather unique position, so instead of step 1, 2, etc, we're going to discuss the sides they can and can't take and how they achieve their interests with that faction. Starting with the houses the Tyrells can't side with. No time wasting here, the Tyrells have little to nothing to gain by siding with the Starks, the Vale, or the Greyjoys. The Starks just want Joffrey's head, vengeance on the Lannisters, their girls back, and the North's independence. They make it crystal clear they don't care for the politics of the South or the Iron Throne. Once they've achieved their goals, they'll want to bugger off back to the North, and rule and prepare their kingdom ready for winter and Danny's potential invasion. And depending on the timeline, Rob, the king in the North, is likely already married, so the Tyrells won't even benefit from having a queen in the north. The Vale just want to be left in peace. Again, nothing to gain, especially the throne, and Sansa's unlikely to escape to the Vale at this rate depending on how the Siege of King's Landing goes, so Lysa's going to be sticking around for a wee while longer. And finally, the Greyjoys. I mean, just look at the place. It's so worthless, Robert didn't even install a new lord when he gave Balon a beating back in the day. Without Euron, mainly the book version, they are a weak faction that consists mainly of pirates and raiders and have no rightful claim to the Iron Throne. Siding with them makes an enemy of everyone, including the North. That leaves us with the Lannisters, the Baratheons, and Danny slash Dawn. 
Before we continue, I just wanted to give an announcement about our Discord server. But if you do want to talk to us more directly or have video ideas to share or just want to shoot the breeze about your favorite fiction, feel free to stop by. So let's begin with my personal favorite house, the Baratheons. The Tyrells won't ever side with Stannis because it's the right and honorable choice and puts the lawful king on the throne. They will only do it if they're getting a piece of said throne. For this to be an even remotely viable option for the Tyrells to achieve their goals, a good heap of sense needs to be talked into Renly instead of stabbed into him. Which as we've said before, not impossible, but a tall order with how stubborn Renly is. The Tyrells also need to have some serious patience and wise foresight. Marrying to Stannis is an impossibility, however Shireen could possibly be betrothed to Loris, giving the Tyrells a strong tie to the royal fold in the long run, though not quite a seat at the throne. Dannis wouldn't like it, as he and the Tyrells have history, and it isn't pleasant, but having the Tyrells on his side all but wins his war against the Lannisters, and his council would likely inform him of that. For a shot at the sharp chair and a stronger voice at the table, the Tyrells will have to look to Renly and his union with Marjorie. No two ways about it, Renly needs to be persuaded to capitulate to Stannis and accept the show-only offer of becoming Stannis' heir until a son is born to him, which even a modicum of patience would show Renly is a near impossibility. If, and it's a big if, this can be achieved, the Tyrells have locked themselves into the royal fold not once, but twice. They're at the table, they just need to get to the head of it now. The Lannisters will be defeated, Joffrey will be dead, and Stannis will sit the throne. They may also gain a valuable game piece with the capture of Sansa Stark, assuming Illyn doesn't off her like Cersei threatened. The war isn't over yet though, with the Lannisters defeated at the Siege of King's Landing, there's no Red Wedding, so there's Robert's Rebellion 2.0 to deal with regarding the Northerners, and this must be dealt with. Stannis is the rightful ruler of seven kingdoms, not five, and he'll want the North back along with the Riverlands. Faced with the might of the Stormlands and the Reach, who thanks to the Reach's grain wealth are one of the few factions who could realistically supply and fight a war in the North, Rob may bend the knee or maybe capitulate to save Sansa, assuming she was captured. If not, he needs to be crushed before Danny arrives and a loyal warden of the North installed. Push comes to shove, if they did capture Sansa, they could maybe use her as bait to provoke the North into staying in the South to rescue her. The Roses and Stannis have got to do something to keep Rob out of holding up in Winterfell. Along with Highgarden and the Eyrie, it's one of the most difficult strongholds to siege in both the books and the show, and would cost time the Roses and the Stags just don't have in order to starve Rob out. How do you guys think the Stags and Roses could handle Rob here? Let us know in the comments. When the dragons come knocking, or shall we say burning, Stannis will likely already have Dawn at his ass from the south, unless he can win their loyalty. In both the books and the show, they are basically for the Targaryens and themselves. The last thing he and the Roses need is the North coming to any kind of arrangement or alliance with Danny. Nope, the North must be back in the fold and fresh oaths of fealty sworn for both the Stags and the Roses' sake. A costly but necessary step. The Roses are at the table, but they're not on the throne, and they certainly won't have any major influence over Stannis and his Iron Will, no matter how hard they try to leverage their wealth and grain supplies. Stannis has got to go, and be replaced with Renly for this to become a true win for the Roses. This is where patience and a bit of careful planning will have to come into play. We mentioned in our Stannis vid about the Tyrell scheming with Renly to incentivize an accident to befall Stannis, and how it puts Renly and by extension Marjorie on the throne, but why it also dooms them and buggers the realm, so we'll not repeat ourselves. If the Tyrells want to make it through the dragons and the icy darkness, they need to hold off on the Manis murdering and pick the right moment. The Baratheon claim, which is now also the Tyrell claim, rests on the right of conquest. The Baratheons have no choice but to fight Danny, and because they're locked in through marriage, neither do the Tyrells if they want to hold on to their position on the ladder and avoid being knocked back down to the bottom. Renly would be a great peacetime king, but not a strong wartime king who would be able to repel the Dothraki horde, unsullied legions, and free dragons. You need a strong king with battle experience that will hold things together, and even then, victory isn't assured. Stannis is a strong king. He's firm but fair, and when push comes to shove, he can make the hard choices needed to fight wars. Don't you dare play that clip top! <laughs> This is the payment that was demanded by King Stannis. There's only one reliable leader left in Westeros. Stannis.
Needless to say, in this situation, he is the Tyrell's best hope of standing firm against the Mother of Dragons. And considering he hasn't killed Renly in this timeline, he may have a few shadowy tricks left to play. If Danny starts winning and can avoid being shadow babied, the Tyrells can maybe turn cloak and bend a knee, but they'll have lost their position of influence with the crown. Danny, before going nuts, won't hold them in any form of trust since they've sided with the Targ's number one enemy when it suited them. And she'll likely see them for the scheme as they are, and with that, there'll be no clawing their way back. So that's an Elinar book. Then there's the White Walkers. We kind of need Stannis around for that too. Especially if Jon is murdered with no Mel to resurrect him, which means no solid warning and no solid prep. Which means the White Walkers likely get a lot further than Winterfell with a much bigger army. I'm telling you, Tom, those freaks had a way past the wall besides dragons. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. Get your hands off me. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. The king is tired. See him to his chambers. Come along. Without Azora High, Azora High, Tom, the realm's only hope is a strong, battle hardened king willing to make hard choices and to rally behind. Without hacks from Danny, without destiny from John, you need someone like Stannis or the Walkers will most definitely kill everyone. But how can the Tyrells possibly predict and anticipate dragons and ice zombies knocking at the door? This is where luck and, we'll call a spade a spade, contrivance comes into play. You can smell the shit from five miles away. If we sprinkle in a little more contrivance, well, more than we normally do, Tom. The Red Lady is present, and she would function as a great master of whispers, as well as being a pretty effective anti-assassin for Stannis. She might potentially see signs in the fire of Danny's arrival or the attack on the North by the White Walkers. Heck, she might even prevent the first few attempts on the Manus' life from the Tyrells and scare them and Renly into biding their time, which sort of works out for the Tyrells. This is the only way for the Tyrells to make it through the long night in this scenario. It's counterintuitive, but if Mel doesn't act against the Tyrell's interests and Stannis is removed too early in favor of Renly, the White Walkers or Danny will definitely take the win. Once the Walkers are dealt with, Stannis' assassin shield becomes dust in the wind. Assuming Stannis survived, or even if he didn't and Mel brought him back, this would be where the Tyrells strike and have him offed. Again, potentially, placing Renly and Marjorie on the throne, and again securing their victory. So, as you can see, it's possible for the Roses to win by backing the Baratheons, however you're relying on what would effectively be divine intervention rather than our usual contrived nudges. What happened here was a miracle, and I want you to fucking acknowledge it. Alright, it was a miracle. Anyway, on to our next faction, Dawn and Danny. I'm lumping these two together, as in both the books and the show, they are aligned or seeking to align with the same goals in mind. Destroy the Lannisters and depose the Baratheons, though the Dornish plan is admittedly more complicated in the books. You've also got to factor in the long-standing bad blood between Dawn and the Reach. They won't be friends without some of Danny's famous, look, I've got dragons, be on the winning side, bro, glue sticking them together. The last time a Tyrell came to Dawn, he was assassinated. Now, this alliance did actually come to fruition in the show, however, it was more of a Hail Mary on Elena's part to avenge the destruction of her house and family. So we're instead addressing the Tyrells aligning with Danny from the start to secure their victory conditions. The Tyrells need only do one thing during the War of the Five Kings in this scenario. That's right. Nothing. Sit back and let the war unfold without their interference, Rob and Stannis will take down the Lannisters and then turn on each other, depleting themselves even more. When word of Danny, her dragons and her unsullied army reaches Olenna, reach out using our favorite spider, assuming he talked his way out of being crisped during King's Landing Siege, or perhaps your own messengers, though admittedly less reliable, and get a feel for what type of person Danny is and begin negotiating early on. Offer to support Danny's claim, pledging the Tyrell's army, supplies to keep her armies fed, a less hostile state ground all in exchange for Danny marrying Loris or Willis and joining their houses. That's an unbelievably strong offer, and Danny would be incredibly foolish to turn it down. It's win-win for both parties, and Danny has proposed marriage for far less. The Tyrells get tied to the throne with a reasonably inexperienced monarch they can counsel, guide, and to some degree influence, and Danny gets the loyalty and support from perhaps the most valuable kingdom. Besides the Long Night, the Tyrells have won. The only major area of concern is the consequences for sitting out the war. With the Lannisters vanquished and the main war over, 
far quicker. Stannis will begin to consolidate his power and seek fealty and support from the kingdoms who haven't thrown in with the North. And who is his first port of call going to be? That's right, the richest house with the non-depleted army and grain supplies to help him successfully conduct his war against Rob. The Northerners will have gone home after grabbing or even just seeing Joffrey's head, and will likely be prepping for Stannis' invasion and the coming winter. They won't be harassing Stannis in the slightest unless he's captured Sansa, and even then they'll possibly be prioritizing the mini war with the Greyjoys to get their homes back instead. And the Greyjoys only attacked the North, leaving them out of Stannis' hair, well, what's left of it, allowing the Manis to focus fire his attention. They've got a big army, but I'm just not sure the Tyrells can hold off the might of the Manis once he's regathered his strength. He's one of, if not the best, military commanders alive in Westeros. The Tyrells do have Randall Tarly, a highly renowned commander in his own right, even defeating Bobby B during the rebellion, but they themselves are not famed for their great military commanders. The Tyrells will have some time, as Stannis will need to recover his strength and numbers after depleting it against the Lannisters, but there's a good three to four years between the Battle of the Blackwater and Danny setting foot on Westeros, and the Tyrells do not have a big fleet to speed up getting Danny to them. This could play in a multitude of ways. The Tyrells could just outlast Stannis and make him trying to conquer them a huge problem with their huge stocks of grain alongside knowing the terrain, in addition to Tarly leading the armies, or Stannis may just breeze through, laying siege to Highgarden and eventually starving them out. And who knows how long that might take, but we all know if things become exceptionally problematic, Stannis does have alternative routes to cutting the heads off of snakes. Then there is Dawn to consider. Now if Stannis wins the Battle of the Blackwater, Oberyn won't be overbrained, but Dawn will likely still have interests with the Targaryens, but they and the Reach have history and it's not friendly, so they likely won't be helping the Tyrells repel Stannis, at least until Danny shows up. And we can't discount them vying for Danny's favor, which they may get if the Tyrells spend their bargaining chips trying to beat back Stannis. Assuming the Tyrells can hold out, however, and maintain their bargaining chips, the future is bright for them. Danny arrives, beats back Stannis, makes good on her agreement to marry Loris, and the Tyrells, Dawn and Danny join forces to topple the Manis and seize the throne. With Rob still knocking around, he might negotiate a truce with Danny or potentially bend the knee to Drogon. And because Rob's around, Jon likely won't be stabbed, we've explained why in previous videos. Which gives us a strong warning and a very strong force consisting of the North, Danny, the Reach, and Dawn to face the walkers behind Azor Ahai. The actual Azor Ahai, Tom. No, the real one. God damn it, Tom. So yeah, once again, the Tyrells can win by siding with Danny off the bat. But once again, there are some very contrived and luck-based circumstances to factor in, especially the daunting task of holding out in the open field for two to three years against the most competent military commander still alive, who's also armed with dark magic. When backing both Stannis and Danny, you've also got to factor in a very out of character suppression of ambition for the Tyrells. The War of the Five Kings starts, and the resulting chaos it breeds creates opportunity. Opportunity the Tyrells dig their fawns into immediately and use to climb the ladder, jumping up one more rung every time the one they are on feels like it's about to break. For them to win with Stannis or Danny, you are asking them to stay off the ladder when it's at its most climbable, and for them to employ the wait and see approach. I would ask you to find it in your heart to do us the great honor of joining our houses. We know with hindsight that it could pay off in the long run, but to look at these options in the moment, there are heaps of uncertainty and a great degree of risk. Here's the thing with George R. R. Martin's works. Smart, ambitious characters actually act smart and ambitiously to back it up. 100% so in the books, and at least up until season 5-ish in the show. Olena is one such character. She plays the game extremely well, with only Tywin and pre-bastardized Littlefinger and Varys able to stand in the same league. You want to know how the Tyrells can win the Game of Thrones? Look at the actual choices the Roses make in the canon story. Renly is their first choice because he has many qualities that make for a great king, but enough weaknesses and flaws that he can be molded and influenced. When Renly is no longer an option, they rearrange their position on the board and ally with the final faction to consider, and there's good reasons why. 
So what about the Lannisters? I think it's kind of important to note just how freaking close this choice put the Tyrells to total victory in the Game of Thrones, with room to navigate both Danny and the White Walkers on the cards. Marjorie was queen, the Tyrells had a financial and resource stranglehold over the monarchy and realm, the king was weak-willed and malleable, granting Marjorie and by extension the Tyrells total power by proxy. The two shrewdest and most intelligent members of the Lannister elite were disposed of, leaving Olena as queen bee of political manoeuvring with no one to threaten her scheming, the Boltons were happy in the north, plus they deal with the threat of Stannis at no cost to the crown, and the Freys are happy with the Riverlands, assuming they get help in retrieving Riverrun, and Neva is looking to challenge for the big sharp chair anytime soon, and Littlefinger is playing tea parties beyond the capital and has kind of become useless. God, I miss book and early season Littlefinger so very much. There was literally one thing standing between them and total victory, at least until dragons and zombies come to play. This bitch. Cersei undid absolutely everything with one stupid move, sanctioning the arming of the faith, leaving the Tyrells and unwittingly herself in a cold war with the High Sparrow, a foe smart enough to outplay them at every turn, requiring balls to the walls ruthlessness, and let's be honest, a ridiculous amount of overkill to defeat. I say we take off and nuke the entire site for Morbid. It's the only way to be sure. Fucking A. The Tyrells need only make one vital move. Remove Cersei earlier on. With extreme prejudice. Olena knows what a she is, but underestimates her ability to act on callous impulse. Poison or some other form of assassination, something that can absolve the Tyrells of blame of course, Tommen will be upset, but I'm sure with Marjorie warming his bed and comforting him, he'll somehow find a way to cope, bless him. This is all I want to do. All day, every day, for the rest of my life. And don't say this is out of character for the Tyrells. They have no issue switching sides and having people they deem threatening removed, and have shown they are very good at covering it up. So much so that Olena had to confess it twice herself, just so others but her could know. Tell Cersei. I wanted to know it was me. The shoe just needs to drop a little quicker with Cersei. This way, the High Sparrow remains an inspirational figure to the poor with some level of influence. But without the power of the Faith Militant behind him, any uprisings can be quashed with force quickly and quietly. This isn't all peachy though, there are some knock-on effects. Jaime will also need to be contained, left to his devices he'll wreak havoc and maybe even start a mini war with some of the Lannister forces at his back. Maybe not killed, but certainly framed for something, maybe even Cersei's death itself, and locked up at the minimum. Luckily, with only one hand, he won't be able to pull a Barristan the badass Selmy. Seriously, fuck you d, d for killing that magnificent old bastard off. Things then need to be smoothed over with the less problematic Lannisters. Luckily, Kevin isn't fond of Cersei and may even approve of her removal. And with Jaime potentially off the board, Kevin becomes de facto leader of House Lannister. And as long as those interests with the crown are maintained, I don't see him causing too much of a fuss. With these little bits of cleanup, the Tyrells maintain their power and still hold some pretty good pieces on the board to play with when Danny and the Walkers arrive. Cersei isn't around to pick off Danny's allies and closest friends, making the likelihood of the Mad Queen a lot less likely, as well as continually fucking up the Tyrell's plans. Loris is alive and unbroken, and still a valuable alliance securer. Jon still has his journey and can adequately warn of the White Walkers and prep the realm, though he does of course depose the Boltons and the North secedes once again. But this may have the benefit of motivating Danny to secure allies to help unify the realm before she makes, um friends with her nephew. When Danny shows up, the Tyrells have no choice but to temporarily concede power. Tommen will be deposed, likely bending the knee willingly in all honesty. The Lannisters will either bend or be destroyed, probably bend with Kevin in charge and Tyrion to talk him down and maybe even take over. He's not an idiot after all. And with it, Marjorie will be shunted from the throne. Better to accept this than fight to the bitter end in a battle they will most definitely lose, especially if post-season 6 logic is in play and Danny's armies respawn at the spawn points like her Dothraki did. Danny will have the throne and won't be budging, but the Tyrells are not done and they have a card to play. Winter is coming and the White Walkers will arrive. Now we know the North and Danny can defeat the Walkers by themselves without help from the South, but they don't know that at the time. They're looking for all the help they can get. I mean for fuck's sake, they were even willing to turn to Cersei in the show's canon story. Who has the largest armies? Who controls the biggest grain supply? Who could ensure the realm doesn't 
wouldn't starve to death in the coming winter? This house right here, baby. Danny could of course take it by force, but it would be costly, and assuming the god mode, teleport, and no hunger cheat isn't active like it was in season 7 and 8, it could waste time they simply don't have. Danny threatens force, Olena steps in with a simple, no need, marry Loris or Willis and bring us back into the royal fold and I'll pledge everything to the cause. Danny has considered politically motivated marriages for far less in the past, and with the threat the walkers pose looming, literally every member of her council is going to be shaking her senseless to take the deal, which, if we're being honest, is pretty fair. And that would just about do it for the Roses. Assuming the Night King is vanquished by Azora High, again I said Azora High Tom, and Loris survives the Long Night, which as one of the best warrior named characters in the show and books he should do, the Tyrells would have regained their spot within the royal fold with a strong queen at the helm, with just enough inexperience to require their counsel and therefore their influence. The Tyrells once again win. The Tyrells did most of the work for us on this one. Their canon decisions, with the exception of allowing one ruthless, evil bitch to stay breathing, consisted of the right choices and fewest risks. They just needed to get rid of Cersei sooner rather than later, and play nice but still maintain a backbone with Danny, and they'd have won. And that about does it! We'll leave the tidbits regarding the impact of Jon's legitimacy, Sansa's meddling, Marjorie's potential meddling, Arya's impact, and the Greyjoy's interference and so forth to you guys on this one if that's okay. We never get them all anyway, and you guys filling in the gaps and addressing the butterfly effects that our changes causes what makes the comments fun. 